from the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario, and I would like to welcome you to today's webinar as we officially release um, the newest best practice guideline, oral health supporting adults who require assistance. And this guideline is a revision and replaces the previous first edition guideline, oral health nursing assessment and intervention, which was released in 2008. So we're very happy to be releasing the guideline during nursing week. Um, it's a great way to end um, the full week of activities here that we've had at RNEO. And we're really uh, proud to recognize all the registered nurses, nursing students, nurse practitioners, and registered practical nurses who are providing day in and day out quality care. Um, and we wanna thank you for all your hard work during this pandemic and keeping the public safe and caring for those who have become ill. And we know that oral health, um, the oral health guideline is implemented across sectors, but it is highly um, utilized in the long-term care sector, a sector that is particularly being affected by this pandemic. So we really wanted to call out and appreciate all the nurses and all the health workers who are working in long-term care at this time. And the BPG, this oral health BPG, it does recognize how important oral health is to the overall health and well-being of um, patients and our clients and the link between oral health and systemic disease, including respiratory disease and the importance of um, infection prevention and control while providing oral care. So on today's webinar um, is myself, um, Megan. I am the Associate Director of Guideline Development and Evaluation at the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario. And we are also very fortunate to be joined by our two panel co-chairs of this best practice guideline, Dr. Greg Dale and Dr. Min Yu. And I'm going to be providing a brief introduction to both of our co-chairs um, who will be speaking about um, the practice education and organization recommendations in the guideline. So Dr. Craig Dale is a registered nurse and assistant professor at the Lawrence S. Bloomberg Faculty of Nursing. And he's also a CHR embedded clinical scientist in oral health at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre and a scientist at the University of Toronto Centre for the Study of Pain. Dr. Dale's research focuses on fundamental patient care for acute and chronically ill adults, including oral hygiene, pain, and communication. And he specializes in qualitative mixed methods and patient engagement research approaches. Craig is the recipient of the 2017 RNEO Leadership Award in Nursing Research and the 2017 Sigma Theta Tau International Lambda Pi at Large Chapter Dorothy M. Pringle Award for Excellence in Research and Craig teaches in both undergraduate and graduate nursing programs. Dr. Min Yoon is an associate professor at the University of Alberta School of Dentistry. Dr. Yoon joined the school in 2012 and as an assistant professor following her PhD from the University of Toronto. And her dissertation focused on the oral health of vulnerable long-term care populations. And specifically, she has investigated the relationship between oral health status and the risk of developing aspiration pneumonia explored interprofessional perceptions surrounding oral care and the translation of evidence-based practice at the front line of care. So thank you both for being here today um, and we're, we were so privileged to have your uh, leadership throughout the development of this guideline. So the really the objectives of today's webinar are to describe the develop, guideline development process including the systematic reviews that were conducted and to also highlight the guideline recommendations and how to interpret the discussion of evidence that follows each of the, um, the recommendations in the BPG. And finally, um, it is to provide you an overview of the resources available to support guideline implementation. So who is the RNEO? Many of you on the line are familiar with RNEO. Um, we are the Professional Association of Registered Nurses, Nurse Practitioners and Nursing Students in Ontario, Canada. And we have advocated for healthy public policy, promoted excellence in nursing practice, increased nurses' contribution to shaping the healthcare system, and influenced decisions that affect nurses and the public they serve since 1925. And the Best Practice Guidelines Program is a signature program of RNEO, and to date we have published 53 Best Practice Guidelines, and they are being actively implemented within Ontario and across um, health sectors and um, nationally and around the globe. So before I begin, I just wanted to highlight that the oral health guideline is now online. Um, it is free to download. Um, you can just click on the download button and you'll be able to download a PDF copy. 
If you do wish to have um, a hard copy of the guideline, you can contact us and we will be able to um, address that uh, need if you do require, would like to purchase a print copy of the guideline. So I also wanted to just highlight that in addition to the um, guideline that we have posted online, we've uploaded a few supplemental documents. And this is really to make our um, guideline development process as transparent as possible. So you will see that you're able to download um, a guideline search strategy that we use when we search for other um, guidelines that can inform this guideline. Our systematic review search strategies for each of the um, research questions that were asked, as well as um, the evidence profiles. And the evidence profiles are really a summary document of the literature that was found that informed um, the recommendations in the guideline. It includes details of each of the um, key details for each of the studies, as well as the quality appraisal scores that the research team conducted. And then we also have here the conflict of interest declarations of the expert panel. In addition, I wanted to highlight an important document. So, um, we've also uploaded how the recommendations in the previous best practice guideline of oral health compared to the guideline, um, the revision of the guideline. Um, and so the table really outlines the practice recommendations that were found in the first edition and then where that information can now be found within the revised edition of the oral health guideline. So if you are using the current or the previous oral health guideline, um, take a look at this table. It could be a very helpful uh, tool for you. So I wanted to acknowledge um, the team at RAO that um, really uh, supported the work of this guideline development process and the publication. This guideline was led by Julia Zuckel, our lead guideline development methodologist. She wasn't able to be here today as she is on parental leave. And there was a number of other RNAO staff members, including uh, members from our evaluation and implementation science team. So I wanted to acknowledge all their contributions to the guideline. And then in addition, um, we would like to acknowledge the tremendous expertise and guidance of our co-chairs and the full expert panel and the development of this guideline. So the panel was really committed to the project and provided critical oversight and support. And it, um, the panel consisted of a variety of oral health experts, including nurses, as well as members of the interprofessional team, such as um, dental hygienists, pharmacists, dentists, personal support workers, as well as um, Care, people with caregiving experience, and um, they represented a variety of sectors, including long-term care, acute care, and public health. And so we really wanted to acknowledge and thank the expert panel for their uh, guidance and expertise and um, formulating and helping to support um, the publication of getting this guideline online and in print. So um, here's a picture of the RNAO expert panel at the launch in 2017. And we do have a member of the panel who joined today, Paula Benbo. Um, she's a registered dental hygienist and former manager at the Canadian Dental Hygienist Association. So um, she wanted to say a few words about her uh, experience and what this guideline means. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I just wanted to say thank you to, to RNAO and the, the co-chairs for, for leading this project and for recognizing the importance of oral health for, for adults and specifically those who, who require um, assistance. The entire team did an excellent job in, in preparing uh, this resource using a systematic evidence-informed approach. There was a, a considerable amount of time spent identifying credible scholarly peer-reviewed literature to inform the recommendations. Uh, but the team also placed great emphasis on recognizing the expertise of the, the panel and considered uh, you, the end users, throughout the, the entire process. So for all of you on, on this webinar, I hope you're able to use the recommendations, the templates, the appendices um, within this best practice guidelines to really influence change within your organization and promote the, the oral health and well-being and quality of life of others. So thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. And I also wanted to um, acknowledge, and, and actually I recognized a few uh, names from the participants on the line today, the 48 stakeholder reviewers that provided feedback on the guideline and, and um, helped to enhance the content and the usefulness of the guideline. So their names can actually be found on pages 26 to 28 of the 
a PDF. And I also wanted to point out that the guideline has been um, endorsed by the Ontario Dental Association, the Canadian Dental Hygienists Association, and the Association of the Canadian Faculties of Dentistry. And you can find their endorsement letters at the back of the guideline. Um, so just to start off with uh, the purpose of this guideline, um, the purpose of this BPG is to provide nurses, the interprofessional team, and caregivers with evidence-based recommendations uh, for oral care for adults that will promote an interprofessional approach to providing oral care, enhance the delivery of oral care interventions, and ultimately lead to positive oral health outcomes for persons who require assistance in meeting their oral care needs. And really in this guideline, assistance with oral care could range on a, on a continuum and include supervision, prompting, um, and full physical assistance with providing care. And this BPG as a foundation really recognizes them that person and family-centered care is an essential component of providing oral care. And that when providing any oral care, um, infection prevention um, and control practices should be followed. So in the guideline, um, within the appendix, we offer some resources on person and family centered care and infection prevention and control. Um, and one of those resources is the RNAO best practice guideline on person and family centered care. Um, so you'll know that the purpose of the guideline hasn't changed from the first edition, which was also had a focus on adults over the age of 18 um, with supporting them to meet their oral care needs across health settings. And then just um, of note, a couple things that were considered outside of the scope of this guideline um, included oral care for infants and children and adolescents, oral care specific to the needs of pregnant women, um, oral care that went beyond routine um, nursing practice, such as um, can, sort of interventions that need to be provided by an oral health professional, such as billing or denture repair, repair, and then management of oral cancers and cancer related treatments. And you can find more details on the scope and the intended audience of the guideline and the foundational principles that I spoke about on page six of the online document. So within the defined purpose and scope that I just spoke about, the recommendations in this guideline uh, reflect the topic areas that the expert panel prioritized based on the current need for guidance and practice. So this strategy is a bit distinct from the first edition of the guideline in that it did ask specific questions and identified priority outcomes. And this was done in an effort to provide specific and targeted recommendations, but it also reflects a new uh, standard for developing guidelines that RNU has adopted since 2017. And it stands for GRADE. So GRADE stands for the Grading of Recommendations, Assessment, Development, and Evaluation. And it really provides a framework for us to specifically ask um, specific healthcare questions, and then select priority outcomes of importance to patients, evaluate the, avail the available evidence on that topic, and then come to recommendations um, based on the evidence, but also the values and preferences of uh, persons that will be affected by the recommendation and the clinical expertise of the panel. Um, and so for this guideline, you can see here that the expert panel um, looked at four areas of priority, including uh, whether or not um, an interprofessional approach to oral care uh, was beneficial, the use of an oral care protocol, and strategies and techniques that should be recommended um, for improving outcomes for um, persons who require assistance, and then also strategies and techniques for providing oral care to persons who are behaviorally complex. Um, and I did want to note that uh, this area or this recommendation uh, question that was posed is new, the old guideline didn't have a specific target on um, providing care to those who are behaviorally complex or what we mean by that is persons exhibiting a responsive behaviors or care resistant behaviors during oral care. So um, recommendations that came out of this question are, are newer to this guideline and in the subsequent slides when we speak to the recommendations there's a little um, logo of new so you'll know what the new content is um, for this BPG. The panel was also asked to prioritize specific outcomes that could be impacted as a result of the, um, the, re the recommendation questions or interventions. And you'll see some of the prioritized outcomes that are common across the recommendation questions include oral health status, frequency of oral care, and knowledge and the ability of health providers to provide that oral care. Um, 
So um, the, these recommendation questions inform the systematic reviews that then informed the recommendations in the guideline. So on this slide here, you'll see um, our guideline development uh, process map, so the PRISMA chart. And what you'll note is that um, the guideline development team here, we worked with the health science librarian to conduct the systematic reviews. We started off with more than uh, 13,000 articles, which were screened in duplicate across the four research questions. Um, all of the articles were then assessed for quality and at the end, 37 research articles informed um, the recommendations found within this guideline. So um, the, the recommendations can fall within three areas. There's three recommendation types within this guideline. Um, you will find a section on practice recommendations and these really outline what the nurse or members of the interprofessional team needs to do. Um, and then we have education recommendations, which really outline what the nurse and or um, interprofessional team needs to know or strategies for providing that education. And then finally, the organization and policy recommendations outline what the organization can do to create an evidence-based culture. And finally, the last um, uh, area I'm going to review before we get into the recommendations is how to read a recommend the recommendation statements and the discussion of evidence. So if you are familiar with the RNEO guidelines, you'll notice that the layout of the recommendations are slightly different than the first edition of the oral health guideline and some of our other guidelines. Um, so I'm just going to go through what the discussion of evidence um, and the recommendations look like. So you'll see um, I also think there's also snippets of the recommendations from the online resource on here that you can see. So for each of the recommendations, um, you will see a box which outlines the recommendation statement. And then it, the box also includes the strength of the recommendation and the certainty of the evidence of effects. And the strength of the recommendation is determined by the expert panel to either be strong or conditional. And there's a couple of factors that, they, um, that the expert panel assesses in determining the strength. So they look at the benefits and harms of the intended recommendation, uh, the preferences and values of patients, as well as the certainty of the evidence. And the certainty in the, of the evidence of effects refers to the quality and confidence of the results that, um, that were found from the systematic reviews or from the literature. And so then the panel can reach an agreement based on those factors, whether they determine a recommendation to be strong or conditional. And to have a strong recommendation, uh, the panel needed to reach a consensus of over 70%. And then the rec followed the recommendation box is the discussion of evidence. And the discussion of evidence includes six components. So for the first component, we have um, the benefits and harms. Um, and that, that's highlighted on the screen here. So it, this is really um, a section that highlights the desirable and undesirable outcomes that were reported in the literature when the recommended practice was, um, was completed. And then following the benefits and harms, we have the values and preferences. And so this section really highlights um, any preferences for the recommendation and the values placed on the health outcomes, res uh, the resulting health outcomes from the recommended practice from a patient perspective. Um, in this guideline, it also captured uh, literature um, on preferences of health providers for, um, in relation to following the recommended practice. And then the health equity section highlights the impact that the recommended practice could have on health outcomes across different populations or settings and or barriers to implementing the recommended practice in particular settings. The fourth component on your screen here is the expert panel justification of the recommendation. And this really provides a rationale um, for the decision making um, related to the strength of the recommendation. So why the panel decided to vote on a strong versus conditional recommendation. And then um, following um, the expert panel justification, you will see a fifth component called practice notes. Um, and this section really includes pragmatic information on how to um, support implementing the recommendation. Um, this can come from the evidence, but it can also come from 
the expertise of the expert panel and it supports a little bit of the um, contextualizing the recommendation or, or um, how to implement the recommendation in practice. And the final and sixth component um, is the supporting resource section and this includes helpful websites, tools or links um, that are related to the recommendation um, that could help support implementation and practice. So that sort of concludes how to review um, the recommendations and discussion of evidence. And I just wanted to um, highlight one other new area that can be found in this guideline. Um, in addition to the recommendation, this guideline also includes one good practice statement. So this good practice statement is um, directed primarily to nurses and the interprofessional team. And it refers to a practice that is already acceptable and practical um, advice. And so the good practice statement is believed to be beneficial and conducting a systematic review to prove its, um, its benefit uh, would not be necessary. So the resulting statement doesn't receive um, a certainty rating or a strength. Um, it's not rated as strong or conditional. Um, the good practice statement was developed to, in this guideline, was developed to capture the importance of assessing a person's oral hygiene beliefs and practices, including their self-care abilities, um, on admission or on initiation of care prior to delivering the subsequent practice recommendations. And the panel was sent a survey asking them to respond to um, about five questions, uh, looking at whether the statement was clear, um, if the message was necessary, would it result in um, positive outcomes, was it necessary to collect to conduct a systematic review and was there a rationale for including the good practice statement. And so based on the overall consensus from the expert panel and uh, coaches from that survey that was sent out, there was a good practice statement included in the guideline um, related to a, um, assessing for oral hygiene beliefs and practices, including a person's self-care abilities prior to delivering the subsequent recommendations in the guideline. So um, with that, I'm going to pass over the um, slides to Dr. Min Yoon, who will be going over the first practice recommendation. Hi, Megan. <clears throat> Sorry, it's Verity. Um, it looks like Min may have been having some technical difficulties or something because she has dropped off the webinar um, for now. Hopefully, she'll be able to rejoin, um, but perhaps you want to go ahead and, and speak to these. Uh, sure. So the first... Um, recommendation in the guideline. Um, recommendation one speaks to um, the health providers following a multi-component oral care protocol that includes an oral health assessment, an individualized oral care plan, step-by-step -step instructions for providing um, oral care within that protocol, and identification of requi required oral care tools and supplies to complete um, the oral care protocol. So within the, the um, literature, what was found to be beneficial for uh, health providers following a multi-component protocol that included these four components is that um, there was a decrease in the rates of both hospital-acquired pneumonia, or HAP, and ventilator-associated pneumonia, that. And it was also found that when health providers uh, followed a multi-component protocol, it may have improved their ability to assess changes in the oral health status of persons. Um, and in the literature, there was no harms found in relation to this uh, recommended practice. Um, due to the certainty of the evidence, um, which was found to be low, this uh, recommendation um, was determined to be conditional. And the rationale for that was there was harms found, uh, there was benefits found, no harms were found, but due to the lower confidence in the evidence, um, the benefits um, might improve, but due to the lower certainty of the evidence, this was found to be a conditional recommendation. Um, and then some key practice points uh, related to this recommendations um, include that um, if a person, these were from the expert panel, that if a person is identified to be at risk for aspiration, they may require a supervision with their oral care. 
There wasn't anything um, in the literature that spoke to the timing of, this, of um, the assessment being done. So if, if an oral health assessment needs to be done, at which time intervals? So um, the expert panel identified that this is um, something that the organization to, should to determine and then clearly communicate that with their, with their staff. If during oral care though, um, a, a change is noted, this should trigger a healthcare provider to go back and complete a full um, assessment. Um, as well, there wasn't um, literature to really speak to um, the timing of oral care being provided, so whether it needs to be provided um, how many times in a 24-hour in a period, but there was general consensus from um, other organizations that um, oral care, including the Ontario Dental Association, the Canadian Dental Hygienist Association, that oral care should be provided at least twice daily. So that's, a, that's something that comes from consensus and clinical expertise. And that when providing oral care, proper infection control practices should be followed. Um, so in order to um, support implementation of a multi-component protocol, which includes an assessment, a plan of care, um, providing that oral care, um, following a step-by-step -step process and um, identification of the appropriate tools and supplies to complete that protocol. There were a number of appendices that have been included in the guideline to support with this. So Appendix J um, includes uh, two sample oral health assessment tools. Um, I, they are the um, oral health assessment tool the OHAT and the throat is included as examples. Appendix K includes sample oral care plans that can be used to help support um, guide your practice and there is two sample oral care plans that were provided in the guideline. And then we've also included toothbrushing techniques. Um, there's uh, pictorial diagrams and um, uh, some in instructions that speak to those techniques as well as denture care um, techniques with pictorial diagrams and instruction that speaks to that. And then Appendix N um, includes tools and products that were found within the literature for providing oral care. It's um, a large table and it speaks to different um, products and what their, um, what, what their use was found in the literature and some key considerations um, and findings and notes about their applicability um, within uh, different practice settings and how they've been used. So that's a, that can be a helpful resource for supporting with the implementation of this recommendation as well. So next we're moving to recommendation two, um, the next practice recommendation. And I, um, I believe that, uh, Craig, you were going to speak to this one. Well, thank you, Megan. And uh, I'd just like to take a moment to uh, thank uh, my co-chairman, uh, the expert panel reviewers, and the entire RNAO team who worked tirelessly to produce this BPG. Um, it's really an honor to be a part of this process. So recommendation two addresses the provision of education for persons and caregivers on oral health and the benefits of oral care, oral care techniques and procedures using return demonstration, establishing oral care practices, how to use oral care tools and or supplies. And the strength of this recommendation is conditional. With respect to benefits, the evidence suggests that when a person and or their caregiver receives education on why and how to incorporate oral care into the person's daily routine, this may increase the frequency of oral care performed and may improve the oral health status of the person. There were no harms identified in the evidence base and the expert panel attributed high value to even small improvements in the oral health status of persons and the frequency of oral care they receive. Uh, the practice notes guide us to consider education and training for persons and caregivers based on a learning needs assessment, which was previously mentioned. And it might be helpful to have a practice example to illustrate uh, recommendation two in practice. So imagine caring for a person in hospital rehabilitation or long-term care setting who has experienced motor sensory impairments following a stroke that inhibit their ability to perform oral care. 
In this case, it's recommended to do a learning needs assessment in order to tailor education to their requests and concerns. Assessment would allow us uh, an instructive response to the person's goals and values for oral health and care, incorporate demonstration of techniques to mitigate motor sensory challenges when undertaking oral care, and observe their ability to repeat those techniques under the supervision of a trainer as a form of appraisal support. So as education is actually a process rather than a single event, reinforcing education through ongoing refreshers can ensure that knowledge and skills are sustained and questions or challenges that come up can be overcome. So next slide, please. So following recommendation two, you'll see a table under the practice notes that provides more detail related to each of the education topics covered in the evidence. And these details were retrieved from the studies within the systematic reviews and provide practical considerations related to recommendation two. So this includes educational content on oral health and disease modes of education delivery, including return demonstration, methods to establish routines or habits among persons with respect to oral health, and how to use tools and supplies suited to persons who require assistance to perform oral care, including those patients who have motor or sensory impairments. So next slide, please. And so I think um, Min is gonna um, speak to recommendation three. Yep, thank you. And sorry, I was having some te technical difficulties. I just want to um, reiterate Craig's appreciation for the uh, RNAO and um, just really applauding the whole team of uh, panelists as well as all our stakeholders who really did contribute to the development of this guideline. So um, recommendation three is uh, something that's new to this um, guideline, and it really focuses on uh, person-centered approaches when we are providing oral care. Um, and the key point to make here is that uh, we're delivering care for people who may be behaviorally complex or who may be demonstrating responsive behaviors. And this was one of the recommendations that um, I think practically or clinically uh, is, is more most fraught with when uh, we're thinking about frontline caregivers in terms of delivering oral care. So um, the things that uh, came out of the literature around this recommendations were focused on um, environmental adaptations as well as providing um, support and education around verbal and nonverbal communication strategies, as well as focusing on the selection and modification of certain oral care tools or supplies based on individual needs. So what we found in the literature around this was that there was a slight increase in the frequency of oral care when these things were considered um, uh, while providing oral care, and it reduced the rate of uh, responsive behaviors. And one of the things that we may want to consider from a practical perspective is that as healthcare providers on the front line are um, providing care, they are actually the most uh, well-versed in the person's preferences, um, time of day that they might prefer oral care. I know that in long-term care facilities, a lot of our healthcare aides who are providing oral care are most intimately um, connected with uh, the, the uh, individuals. And so understanding how to utilize that knowledge about the person in terms of um, adjusting the environment and understanding what perhaps nonverbal communication strategies are most, uh, are most received by an individual, understanding how to actually incorporate those preferences and um, individualizations can actually increase our capacity to deliver oral care and to reduce some of those responsive behaviors. So as an organization, when we are thinking about um, how we might be implementing person-centered approaches, understanding who has the knowledge about the individual and how can we incorporate that becomes really, really critical. Next slide. And I think this is uh, Craig. Sorry. 
Sorry, I think I have the next one, but I'm happy to uh, review this one. Nope, sorry. <laughs> I might have, might have been confused. Sorry, Craig. I will carry on here. Um, and then uh, the recommendation four is also something new to the guideline. And here we um, focus on focus on strategies and techniques in terms of the individualized care plan and how we can actually use that in providing um, the oral care to the persons who are behaviorally complex. And this really, again, ties into the previous recommendation where we're looking at um, delivering person-centered approaches. And this is really fostering our frontline or care providers to have the knowledge and the ability to actually provide oral care that may uh, be slightly uh, different than uh, depending on uh, the individual and understanding how um, these behaviorally complex uh, be uh, responses can actually impact um, not only the care reception from the individual, but also how that impacts the care delivery from the person who's actually providing the care. And one of the things that is important, again, when we think of person-centered approaches, is documenting what has been successful and documenting also what has been unsuccessful so that we actually can have consistent care that is individualized and to actually reduce the amount of resistance or res responsiveness from the individual. So one of the things that we did wanna highlight in this, in this guideline is the importance of documentation of successes as well as uh, unsuccessful strategies, as well as uh, the personal preferences of the individual. So it becomes really important to not only think about the approach from an organizational perspective, but how that is then documented. And I think that then feeds into some of the other strategies when we talk about how we might incorporate um, um, some of the, uh, the preferences and organizational priorities around communication. Thank you. Um, and so there's just a couple of appendices that support with those last two recommendations. So Appendix O on communication strategies, which goes through possible examples that you can use, and Appendix P on threat reduction strategies. And I'm just gonna pass it back to Craig to go through the education recommendations. Great, thanks very much, uh, Megan. So moving on, we'll be talking about um, and outlining what the nurse interprofessional team and those involved in academic preparation of health providers need to know or strategies on how to best provide that education. So next slide, please. So, um, oh, sorry, you were in the right. Okay. One. Thank you. So, Recommendation five comprises the expert panel suggestion that academic institutions implement interprofessional oral care education for students entering the health professions. And the strength of this recommendation is conditional. However, the expert panel attributed high value to the benefits of increasing the oral health knowledge and skill of students or trainees. And in terms of benefits, the literature is clear that interprofessional education does confer benefit and and that an interprofessional approach is defined in this instance as health providers and our students from different health professions learning from and about each other to improve collaboration and quality of oral care delivery. And this approach may improve student knowledge through formal access to theory for oral health and practical skill developing from the provision of oral care. So as an example, an academic institution may collaboratively develop a curriculum in partnership with dentistry or dental hygiene programs to integrate evidence-based oral systemic health information, teaching learning strategies, and clinical experience. So this could include a variety of um, strategies, including dental clinic observation, didactic lectures, group discussion, and or simulation lab practice. And in the literature that was achieved, students noted that the most informative components for improving their knowledge included learning how to perform an oral examination and practicing oral care provision. So this recommendation highlights how academic organizations can play a leadership role in building interprofessional oral health workforce capacity 
to improve oral health access, decrease oral health disparities, and overall oral health outcomes for the communities they serve. There were no harms identified in the literature associated with academic and professional education for students entering the health professions. So next slide, please. So uh, under recommendation five, um, in the practice notes, thank you, there's a table that outlines more details from the evidence strategies within the literature uh, for preparing students entering the health professions. And these include examples of collaborative curriculum content and delivery modes that can serve as a starting point for academic institutions. So thank you, next slide. Okay, so recommendations six and seven closely follow recommendation five. In recommendation six, the expert panel suggests that health service organizations provide education and training on oral care to health providers facilitated by an oral health professional. Moreover, in recommendation seven, the expert panel suggests that health service organizations provide education to health providers that includes interactive hands-on training to identify and implement strategies and techniques that can be used when providing oral care to persons who are behaviorally complex. And you'll note the banner here, the new banner, indicating this is a distinctive addition to the BPG. And the strength of this recommendation is conditional. And the literature here suggests benefit from the provision of education and training to improve knowledge about oral health and methods for providing oral care. And the studies specifically highlighted the importance of implementing hands-on training into oral health education in order to help health providers overcome barriers when providing oral care to persons who are behaviorally complex. Nursing staff valued contact with oral health professionals and also felt more capable of providing oral care to residents who were initially reluctant to receive it. And there are no harms identified in the literature from this recommendation. Now, an example in practice might include a seminar or a point of care learning series detailing how to brush the teeth and care for the dentures of people who are behaviorally complex. In addition to demonstrating of, or demonstration, pardon me, of problem solving, common challenging behaviors, for example, limited mouth opening, exaggerated bite and gag reflex or tongue thrusting. And the practice notes here reinforce the importance of education by an oral health professional on an ongoing basis for both new and existing health providers in order to sustain knowledge and skill. So in these recommendations, education is identified as one component of a multifaceted approach to improving oral care, which also includes an organization exploring their culture and priorities placed around oral health, which would ideally include staff engagement. So next slide, please. And I'm just going to pass it. Thank you so much, Craig. And I'm going to pass it back to Min to go through the last recommendation. Great, thanks. So the last recommendation focuses on um, organizational recommendations. And this section really, or this recommendation, looks at um, how we as, organ as a larger organization or as a facility might take a leadership role to really promote and facilitate uh, oral health and the recommendation states that um, there's that we should implement an interprofessional approach for the provision of care and the strength of the recommendation here is conditional and we might want to think about how as an organization particularly in long-term care which is an area that I focus on we want to think about how uh, how we might facilitate um, different healthcare professionals who are already a part of our interprofessional team, how we might tap into their scopes of practice and their areas of expertise to um, focus and highlight oral care in terms of how we might um, discuss this at uh, interprofessional team meetings. So for example, from a practical perspective, we wanna think about how when we're developing oral care plans, we can involve uh, the different healthcare professions that are already a part of your interprofessional teams to facilitate discussions around oral care and oral health. So for example, when we have an SLP or speech language pathologist on that team, 
A lot of our interprofessional discussions may focus in on dysphagia and aspiration risk, but what might not actually happen is a discussion around oral health. So from a practical perspective, recognizing the team members that are already a part of your facilities and a part of your interprofessional teams, how might we actually go about improving uh, the discussion and, and increasing the discussion around oral care is one of the things that may follow suit in terms of this recommendation. So one of the questions that you may further ask is how can we actually build uh, discussions around oral care and expanding the expertise of oral health considerations. Another thing to consider is how might you draw in oral care professionals that may not necessarily be a part of your team that may but also may be a part of your community. So although the recommendation here highlights practice notes that um, show uh, healthcare professionals that may be typical to your team, such as occupational therapists or respiratory therapists or dietitians. One of the things that may also um, come into to your di discussion is um, drawing from the community of oral healthcare professionals as well. One of the things that um, comes from this recommendation is understanding uh, the inter interprofessional approach that is required um, when we are delivering oral care. It's not just your frontline care staff who will be actually delivering care, but it's understanding what you as an organization can do to actually improve um, uh, the culture around oral care, facilitating this interprofessional approach. Next slide. Thank you so much, uh, Greg and Min, for reviewing the recommendations. It is uh, two, so I wanted to thank um, you both for reviewing the recommendations. And if you're, if you are, if panel, uh, participants are able to stay on, I just would like to go through a couple of um, the remainder of the slides. And if you both have time um, to stay on, there's two questions to go through. So um, I wanted to. Uh, um, bring your attention to the guideline evaluation measures within the oral health guidelines. So if you are an organization that is implementing the guideline, you may want to review the, the indicators or evaluation measures we have that are available um, that can help you um, assess uh, the practice changes that are being done within your organization and how it's improving patient outcomes. Um, and they can also help you to identify areas that further change initiatives are needed. Uh, for any organizations on the call that are best practice spotlight organizations um, or BPSOs, please note that a revised data dictionary will be coming out shortly within the next four to six weeks that provides a bit more detail on each of the indicators for reporting to um, the Enquire data system. Additional guideline appendices that can help support the recommendations that were reviewed inc include Appendix F, which is an algorithm for oral care, which um, summarizes all of the recommendations into a, a workflow pictorial diagram. So you may find that helpful. Appendix G goes over sample questions to obtain an oral health history. And Appendix A uh, reviews is a table on risk factors for oral disease. So what else can you do or what can you do next and how can RNAO help support you with implementation of this guideline? Um, so there is a number of resources that we do have available when we develop guidelines we want to help support their dissemination and implementation into practice. So we encourage you, we provided a high level overview of the recommendations at this webinar, but we encourage you to read the full guideline and perhaps even discuss the guideline with your colleagues. You can also conduct a gap analysis um, as an interprofessional team and look at basically what that is, is looking at your current practices that you do and compare that to the best practice recommendations in the guideline. And you could identify any gaps in your current practices or where there could be improvements made. Um, in the summer, we'll be coming out with a BPG app. Um, it's able to uh, view the recommendations in a more succinct way on your mobile app as we do recognize that the guideline is um, lengthy and it might be something helpful at the point of care to have that information in a mobile app. Um, you can also look at becoming a best practice champion. We have virtual and e-learning series, um, and it basically um, is a program that educates um, participants on how to actually go in a structured way from um, reading a guideline to actually implementing it within practice. 
and the corresponding document to our champions program is the de is the uh, toolkit um, implementation of best practice guidelines and that's available on our website free to download and you may be interested in, in learning more about our best practice spotlight organization program which is an organizational level knowledge translation strategy um, that organizations partner with us to implement uh, gu clinical guidelines within their practice. Um, so there's a, you can go on our website to learn more about the BPSO program. There are other relevant RNEO best practice guidelines that would help support implementation of this guideline, including the facilitating client-centered learning best practice guideline, the person and family-centered care best practice guideline, and developing it and sustaining interprofessional health care. And you can download all of those guidelines on our website free of charge. If you have any questions about today's webinar or the guideline, feel free to contact our project coordinator, Verity Scott, um, and you can also contact us through the RNEO webpage. And I, I want to recognize the Government of Ontario for providing funding for this work. And we're just going to open it up to questions. Um, if Min and Grade, are you, are you able to stay on for five more minutes? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so Verity, I think you were saying we had a couple of questions. Yep, so we have a couple of questions in the chat box. The first is, when you have a combative patient or resident, what do you suggest on how to provide oral health care? Um, so just speaking from um, what we have experienced, not only from a research perspective, but also from a practical perspective, um, the recommendation that we often make is to approach once. And if you are, are received with responsive um, behaviors, then walk away and approach at a later time. Often what we see is that it's just a matter of timing um, and so, you know, approach once and approach again later. So that's one strategy. The next is trying to understand what that, what the resident might be responding to. So it may be an overstimulus of the environment. So perhaps moving the individual to a different location. Maybe it, they might be in pain. So understanding the individual and what triggers that person may be a starting point. And Part of the recommendation is, is that we had highlighted was understanding that person-centered approach. And what that means is understanding the individual. So that would be um, some of the strategies that we would, re I, we would recommend. And I can ask Craig to expand on that. Thank you, Min. I, I would completely agree with Min's approach in terms of a staged approach. Um, in acute and critical care, we note that responsiveness often um, communicates um, a problem that we have not properly assessed. And so there are now tools um, that we use to appraise pain, particularly in patients who are unable to verbally self-report. And so those assessments in response to responsiveness are particularly important and they are validated in some instances for oral care. So we can understand whether or not it's actually painful to have an instrument placed in the mouth and that gives us opportunity to proceed in a different way, for example, through pretreatment for discomfort. And some of those treatments can certainly be um, uh, sort of non-pharmacological in terms of moisturizers, et cetera. But of course, I want to acknowledge that this is particularly frustrating and one of the more complex um, aspects of fundamental care that we encounter. And so one of my recommendations when you're um, seemingly running out of options is to um, um, work with the interprofessional team and alert them. I think um, particularly, and regardless rather of your, your setting, when the interprofessional team isn't aware that oral care isn't proceeding because of responsiveness, it um, negates the opportunity to collaborate and brainstorm and think about problem solving. And so um, that sometimes is one of the last things that happens, but it could be one of the first things that you consider. Um, and, and so that would be some things that are in the literature that we can pull up to look at and, and mobilize. Yeah, and I just wanted to reemphasize that that really does draw in all of the different recommendations, starting from the person-centered approach down to documentation and interprofessional approach to the recommendations that we are sharing here today. Great, thank you. 
Um, we have some good chat in the chat box. If people, um, I believe there's an option for you to send your uh, messages in the chat box to all attendees rather than just panelists. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case, but if it is, please feel free to do that. Otherwise, I can continue to read them out. Um, so there's one comment that says, usually a pa the patient is responsive for a reason, which um, was mentioned. Maybe they're in oral pain and need some gentle support daily, and then they become more accepting. Um, and somebody else said, some homes use music therapy and iPods to help with behaviors as well. Um, so thank you both for those comments. And so um, the next one thing, uh, Verity, sorry, just to reemphasize is that um, I think it's really also important for staff to be educated on certain signs and symptoms that um, that can be related to oral health. So Greg, you, Craig mentioned uh, oral pain, and I know one of the chat members also mentioned that. But sometimes if you're not attuned to recognize that these may be signs and symptoms of let's say oral pain, mm -hmm. um, those, uh, those often get overlooked. So understanding how we can actually facilitate that piece around recognizing, you know, that somebody's not, re not receiving oral care because of certain things and understanding those behaviors and those signs may be an important first step in terms of education as well. Thanks, Min. Um, so the next question is uh, about recommendation seven. How do you source the professionals who have experience in geriatrics and behavioral challenges that can offer hands-on? Well, that's a really good question. I, I think um, Min might have some recommendations in the sense of um, liaisons with the uh, uh, experts in that field so that they can collaborate in developing um, education or a toolbox, if you will, on approaches so that there is a standard knowledge development amongst your team. And do you have any thoughts around who, who, who might contact? So um, across the different facilities, at least from a long-term care or continuing care perspective, I do know that your oral care professionals even within your communities, all have expertise in terms of understanding geriatric patients. Um, they may not specifically have uh, expertise in long-term care in terms of the organization, but understanding how to deliver um, oral care to those uh, clients and understanding how they might educate uh, your facility staff um, is within their realm of expertise. So reaching out to someone in your community uh, from you know dentists dental hygienists that would be my first um, uh, recommendation the other thing is that we're finding that there are lots of oral care champions within uh, different pockets uh, in your oral care uh, within your long-term care facilities or across different facilities so recognizing that there may be an oral care champion that uh, you could tap into is something else that I would recommend Great, thank you. So the next question is, an SLP and myself worked on a QI project regarding enhanced oral care in our complex continuing care population. One of our challenges was actually determining if we were impacting oral health. Um, can you suggest ways that we could evaluate so that it isn't subjective? Hmm. That's a really good question. And of course, that takes us to uh, recommendations for the future with respect to research and measurement. And so this is um, something that we've noted uh, in conducting the guidelines search that the there are good opportunities for measurement that aren't happening. And, and first thing is to think about whether or not there's a validated oral health tool that you have access to and the guideline does actually provide those. So uh, in simple terms, there's an opportunity uh, to do a case series and look at before and after um, evaluation of a cohort of patients if this is a quality improvement project to gain some experience uh, developing objective measures and reevaluating um, your capacity to um, and measure and, and discuss with your team uh, the changes that you're seeing in oral health or oral health related quality of life amongst uh, the care population. So I think that's a fabulous question. 
Um, and just to add to that, um, it says, I should add that my evaluation question above, um, we did link it to st statistically significant reduction in aspiration pneumonia for patients. Um, and the question was more referring to something immediate for staff. So I think, I think you addressed that. Um, yeah, and, and also um, when Rake was saying, it's Megan speaking, um, the, appendis, the appendices in the guideline, um, we give two examples of validated tools, and then we also have the evaluation measures, um, the process and outcome evaluation measures um, on page 19 of the guideline um, that look at ways that you might be able to uh, um, evaluate uh, practice changes and outcomes. Okay, so we're at... Um quarter after two now. And there are a couple of more questions in the chat box that I see related to um, specific practice uh, kind of considerations. Um, rather than answer those here, um, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and, and answer them via email and we can share that, uh, some brief responses to those with, with all attendees today. Um, but thank you everybody for your questions and we'll make sure that we do follow up with them by email. And I would just like to thank um, Craig and uh, Dr. Craig Dale and Dr. Min Yoon for joining us today and um, for providing that clinical um, context to the recommendations. And thank you all the participants on the line today. Um, the discussion and questions have been fabulous and we will follow up with um, responses. So thank you everyone.